A Friday morning on-time launch seems to be more likely now. Of course, fingers are still crossed, but there are more reasons today to be not only hopeful, but confident. For the story, we go to Max Robinson at the Cape. Max? Frank, the last 24 hours have been the most optimistic during the countdown here at Cape Canaveral. The weather is looking much better, and the morale is high among the folks responsible for getting the space shuttle Columbia successfully off that pad and into orbit and safely back here on Earth. Of course, the high point today was the arrival of the astronauts themselves. Rebecca Chase reports. By now, the flight from Houston to Patrick Air Force Base is routine for the two astronauts, but there was nothing routine about today's trip. This time, they are in medical isolation. The countdown is on, and the launch is set. John Young is the veteran. This will be his fifth trip into space. Robert Crippen, the rookie. This will be his first space flight. Their experience may differ, but today they were equally enthusiastic. Uh, we're really looking forward to the flight, and we hope that everything will allow us to go on Friday. It sure looks good for that right now, from what we hear. I just like to echo what John said. We appreciate y'all coming out. We're uh, we're looking forward to it. The Columbia is in great shape, and uh, the launch team tells us it's almost ready to go. So. The rest of the day was reserved for practice landings and briefings. The astronauts had an early dinner so they can go to sleep and get up at 2 a.m. The same as launch day. Earlier there was a practice sea rescue just in case something goes wrong and the space shuttle must come down over water. Frogmen, after dropping into the water, would inflate a life raft. The astronauts would be pulled from the down capsule. A helicopter would lift them to safety. But the shuttle is designed to land on a runway, and no one here expects such a sea rescue will ever be needed. Rebecca Chase, ABC News, Kennedy Space Center. Well, today, for the first time since the countdown began Sunday night, no new problems have been reported. The backlog of work has been taken care of, and the countdown is now a bit ahead of schedule. The other condition which had created some concern, the weather is beautiful today. The forecasters say a cold front which had threatened the launch apparently will stay north, away from the Cape. All signs now point to the likelihood of a launch as scheduled Friday at 6.50 a.m. Eastern Time. We'll have more from here at the Cape, including Jules Bergman's special assignment report on how politics may have made the shuttle's big price tag even bigger. The American Space Shuttle. The director of Soviet cosmonaut training said if the shuttle were used for military purposes, it would be a great tragedy for the world and could start an arms race in space. Max? Peter, those harsh words are in sharp contrast to the spirit of cooperation between the Soviet Union and this country in 1975, the year of the joint Apollo-Soyuz mission. That was also this country's last manned space mission. Tonight in the second part of the special assignment series, Science editor Jules Bergman explores how politics and budget cutting led to that long dry spell. By the end of 1969, the Apollo program had placed four Americans on the surface of the moon. Lunar missions, there were four more in the 70s, were soon to become almost commonplace. NASA was already developing plans for the post-Apollo era, an era in which the space agency foresaw a manned expedition to Mars perhaps as early as this year. Closer to home, NASA's plans called for a manned space station, modest at first, growing to an enormous 100-man permanent facility in Earth orbit. The station's link to the Earth would be the space shuttle. But NASA's plans went even further. The future held manned lunar space stations and even a 48-man permanent lunar surface encampment. This incredibly ambitious space program was also incredibly expensive. NASA was asking for $9 billion a year for the total program. In today's dollars, that's a total commitment of $200 billion for the decade. NASA wanted the stars, but in the end, Congress and the White House financed only low Earth orbit. Then a decision had to be made as to whether to do the space station and supply it with expendable vehicles or, or to do the shuttle, and then have the shuttle perhaps be the first evolutionary step toward the space station. The paring down of the space budget to $5 billion by Congress in March of 1972 left NASA with just one viable manned project, the space shuttle. The Nixon administration lost interest, and in the early 70s began to cut back on the program, uh, uh, created a, uh, finally gave up on a space station, allowed NASA to proceed with a space shuttle, but with uh, almost a factor of two underfunding of that particular endeavor. 
In the first five years of the program, Congress cut the shuttle's budget by $234 million. The overriding question from the beginning was whether Congress had budgeted enough money to successfully complete the program. Many believe the shuttle's lack of funding was the first strike against completing the project on time and on budget. I think it's cost us more and it's taken us longer, and I think we have a somewhat less capable system uh, than we would have had if we had uh, plowed ahead with the original plans and put adequate funding in and maintained that throughout the program. We had to make the best decisions we possibly could very early and hope that those were the right decisions. And when they turned out to be not quite right or we had to adjust the decision, that rebuilt in a delay into the program. That's what underfunding does to you. The second strike against the shuttle was politics. As early as 1971, there were charges leveled against NASA concerning how contracts were awarded to the companies bidding to work on the project. Pratt & Whitney, a company highly respected for its work on earlier liquid fuel rockets, developed a working model of the shuttle's main engines to show NASA. But NASA awarded the contract to Rocketdyne, a division of Rockwell International, which won the orbiter contract as well. Pratt & Whitney, based in Connecticut, filed formal charges against NASA claiming the engine contract award to Rockwell, a California company, was politically motivated. At the time, industry officials suggested there might have been a connection between the fact that Richard Nixon, then president, was from California, as was Rockwell. After its own investigation, NASA dismissed the Pratt & Whitney charges, finding that while both engines were fundamentally equal in design, Rockwell of California could build it cheaper. NASA gave the contract to the lowest bidder. In point of fact, every major shuttle contract went to the lowest bidder. Critics of the shuttle declare that had the engine contract, for example, gone to the higher bidder, there would not have been as many costly and time-consuming delays. And many within the industry who refuse to speak on the record agree. Tomorrow, we'll look at the men, John Young and Bob Crippen, who plan to fly this first shuttle mission. We'll examine the mission itself and what the shuttle will mean to the future of America's exploration of space both scientific and military, and how the military uses of the shuttle kept the program alive. Jules Bergman, ABC News, at the Kennedy Space Center. Tonight's top story, the countdown is going well, and it appears there is a good prospect that the space shuttle will be launched as scheduled early Friday morning. Tomorrow night, I'll be reporting from Cape Canaveral. Max Robinson will be at Mission Control in Houston, and we'll be all set to bring you the story of this wholly new adventure in the space age. That's our report for now on World News Tonight. For ABC News, good night. America's next manned space flight is proceeding on schedule. Two men who will pilot the space shuttle Columbia on its maiden launch Friday morning arrived from Houston today. Astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen say that everything looks good at this point. Crippen says the reusable space shuttle is in great shape and a rash of last-minute snags has been resolved. The official launch time is now set for 6.50 Eastern Time Friday morning. Weather conditions, however, remain a concern. If winds are in excess of 13 miles an hour at launch time, that could force a delay. But as it stands now, the forecasters predict conditions will be what NASA officials want, and the launch could go ahead as planned. For Friday morning's launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia, both astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen arrived at Cape Canaveral today after a final study session at the NASA Space Center in Houston. Both said the Columbia is in great shape, and both are anxious to be America's first men in space in six years. We're really looking forward to the flight, and we hope that everything will allow us to go on Friday. It sure looks good for that right now, from what we hear. I'd just like to echo what John said. We appreciate y'all coming out. We're, uh, we're looking forward to it. The Columbia is in great shape, and uh, the launch team tells us it's almost ready to go. Now, the countdown will be on hold for 11 hours tomorrow so launch crews can get some much-needed rest before the big blast-off on Friday morning. The minor delays that had threatened to delay Friday's launch of the space shuttle come as no surprise. In fact, the NASA people deliberately build in some extra time into their countdown sequence so they could work on any last-minute problems that might crop up. And as Jim O'Brien found out when he traveled recently to the space centers in Houston and Florida, delays are nothing new for the space shuttle. The very first manned vehicle we ever sent into space was the Mercury Redstone rocket. To show you how far we've advanced, today you could fit the capsules from 20 Mercury rockets into the cargo bay of a single space shuttle. This is the singular, most complex system we've ever tried to work with as far as putting something in space, right? 
Very, very definitely. And in fact, it ranks probably as one of the more complex thing ever built by men. 18,000 people are working on the space shuttle project at the.